kinds of questions. Uh, the first question, and I'm going to spend about 60% of the talk on, is what are the rules of symbiotic genome evolution? So when symbionts occupy a niche of a, of a host, uh, how much genetic exchange is there going on between different types of microbes and a common host? Um, I'm also interested in, in sort of the flip side of this. So here, the symbionts are targets of change. They have constraints on their genome when they're evolving within a host. And that's the target, essentially. The genome is the target of change. The agent of change is when a microbe enters into a host, what does it now change to that host's adaptation or even speciation? I think we accept as a biological community, the former much more often than the latter. We understand that symbionts uh, exhibit uh, and regulate an incredible amount of adaptations in their hosts. We less often think about how that interaction and how those adaptations may carry over into uh, evolution's second major category, which is speciation. Uh, and I'll spend about 30 to 40 percent of the talk on that. And I'll leave some morsels for um, actually my postdoc. Robert Brucker, who's coming out here uh, to talk in a few weeks so that he can finish up with the really cool part of that story. So be sure to attend his talk to see the whole story completed. And the uh, way I pull it all together is there's a third frontier that we ask is sort of how does this all work together? What host pathways affect chronic intracellular symbionts that are really an extreme lifestyle for bacteria? How do bacteria live inside a host their entire life um, how do they get passed on? And what kinds of manipulations are they doing to the host genome as they chronically associate with it? I'm not going to be able to talk about this today, um, but essentially what we're looking at here is the host genome and the, and the microbes, and I'm interested in these interactions um, from an epigenetics perspective as well as from a classical genetics, quantitative genetics perspective. I didn't start with the, the first topic, targets of change. Uh, what are the rules of symbiont genome evolution? Now, I want to start with a framework for how I view the bacterial world. It's probably not a complete view, but it's, uh, it's, it's enough to get uh, uh, sort of a, a lens on the, kind, the importance of the question that, that I'm looking at. So I think of the bacterial world in terms of three haplotypes, essentially. You can have um, facultative intracellular bacteria that replicate inside cells of a host, but those facultative intracellular bacteria maintain the ability to also replicate outside a host cell in a free living environment. So they can do it all. They don't need a host, but they can use a host to replicate it. Of course, the free living bacteria are solely extracellular. They replicate only on the outside environments. And you can see that all this pertains to replication so that when we're studying obligate um, intracellular bacteria, they only replicate inside host cells. As, as will become apparent, there are actually features of obligate intracellular bacteria, including whether they're horizontally versus vertically transmitted, that remarkably affects their genomes. So, the same page, if you look at about 400 genomes and you, of bacteria and you categorize them to whether they're obligate intracellular or free living slash facultative bacteria, you can see that there's, a, on average, a pretty significant genome difference. And this is well known for many labs, but this shows it in a sort of conglomerate way of all the genomes that we analyze from the databases. So these are all the obligate intracellular bacteria next to the pink line here. And on average, clearly have about one-fourth to one-fifth of the genome size of facultative and free-living bacteria. So there's an immense amount of variation within, within the facultative and free-living, and I can go into why that might be, but we certainly know why the obligate intracellular bacteria are on average very small. And so you can just think about mitochondrion chloroplasts as sort of the basic biology 110 uh, example where mitochondrion chloroplasts are shrunken down ancient bacteria that became organelles. And obligate intracellular bacteria provide a window into how that may have happened because these are chronically intracellular bacteria that may one day in a million years from now become organelles. Um, so they are in the act of shrinking, and labs have worked on this question. Uh, this is a diagram that I've modified from, um, from Nancy Moran's lab with Howard Ackman. And essentially what they're showing is genome size is a balance between the inflow of the new genes into a bacterial genome 
which can happen through horizontal gene transfer or duplication events. And of course, that gets balanced by a certain amount of gene deletion by loss of fragments, inactivation of genes, and erosion by an overall deletional bias. That deletional bias is important. So it turns out that bacteria in general have a deletional bias. They're always subject to random deletions. And this is actually one explanation why bacteria probably don't grow exorbitantly large. They never get larger than 12 megabases, let's say, because they're always faced with deletional pressure. And if there's a certain amount of acquisition that's making the genome bigger, that tends to be balanced out by how much gene loss there is happening as well. However, when a bacteria becomes intracellular, it's now facing a one-sided trajectory, right? So the gene entry, the gene acquisition is highly reduced because this bacteria is now constrained within a host cell reflected by this rectangle and usually a host membrane that surrounds the intracellular bacteria. So it becomes enclosed and this leads to a rapid loss of, of genes due to various reasons including this mutational bias for gene deletions that I was mentioning. Um, there's also going to be relaxed selection on redundant genes between the bacteria and hosts. So you can imagine that a bacteria makes nutrients for itself while it's free living, but the host cell makes those same nutrients as well. So because the bacteria is now in a host cell, there's going to be relaxed selection on its genome to encode those same functions. So that can fuel the gene loss process, um, as well as just a general reduced exposure to novel gene pools. Okay, so that's how generally we get to small bacterial genomes and ultimately to organelles in a very simplistic way. Here's the seesaw then of sort of the bacterial world. You can see that there's a small obligate intracellular genome up top here, and then there's a large free living bacterial genome here, which is usually populated by the agents of open source evolution, transposons, plasmids, and phages, right? These are the agents of primary primary horizontal gene transfer in the bacterial world. And these often are what make genomes become larger and also what rapidly diversify those genomes. But is this a one-way trajectory? Is it really that there's no DNA inflow into the obligate intracellular world? And that's really where this system picks up because the analysis we did last year with Irene Newton, who's at uh, 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 the University of Indiana, Bloomington, is that we were able to categorize obligate intracellular bacteria with small genomes into two types of ecological lifestyles. There are those that are host switching that can move between different hosts, and there are those that are obligately vertically transmitted. So they get passed from mother to offspring every generation. And if you look at the amount of mobile DNA, or just the presence of mobile DNA, inside the host switching bacteria, we found that 31 out of 32 species had mobile DNA in their genome, yet only three out of eight species had it in the vertically transmitted symbionts. So from a global perspective, it certainly looked like the lifestyle of the intracellular bacteria, rather than it being intracellular itself, was the predictor of whether there's mobile elements and potentially gene transfer in those intracellular bacteria. And this was kind of a correction on how we normally think about obligate intracellular bacteria as being relatively free of these mobile elements that are typical of free living bacteria. Okay, so here's some comp just summed up. We can really think about when a free living bacteria becomes um, symbiotic, it tends to lose, at least in one model, it tends to lose a lot of this mobile DNA and other genes and essentially become smaller without any mobile DNA. But there also appears to be a trajectory where you become smaller, but still maintain mobile DNA. And this became an interest of ours because this really wasn't considered in how we think about endosymbiont genome evolution on average at the time. So we now can overlay transmission or essentially lifestyle of these bacteria onto this model to have a better view into it. But let's get into an experimental system to really understand how these mobile elements survive and flourish inside an intracellular bacteria. So I'd like to point you to uh, this electron micrograph of Wolbachia. And this is a large Wolbachia cell. Um, actually, it's not large. It's only one micron in size. And this picture was taken inside the testes of an insect that we study in our lab. And we noticed that about 11% of the Wolbachia cells 
had these particles inside the, the cells. And these are bacteriophage woe for Wolbachia uh, particles. And we know that they're bacteriophages because if you zoom in and on a, a closer picture of them, you can see this icosahedral-like structure that typifies viruses as well as a tail structure that typifies infectious phage particles. If you look at uh, this uh, diagram in the top right here, this is actually a Wolbachia cell on the bottom that is healthy, granular in structure, multiple membranes, but lacks any phage activity. And then right above it is a Wolbachia cell that looks completely different. So that dense patch that's stained in the middle there, this is uh, called a pycnotic-like patch, which stands for essentially degraded DNA inside this Wolbachia cell. In addition, you can see a membrane that somehow is collapsed inside the cell. Now these membranes are normally on the outside of the cell, but it appears as if this membrane has collapsed inside the cell. This is typical of free what, what phages and free-living bacteria can do to bacterial membranes. And then right where these black arrows are, you can see bacteriophage particles collated as if they're trying to exit the cell. And then here is a Wolbachia cell that looks like it's exactly um, going through lysis. So here is a population of phage particles polarized towards one end of the cell. That's typical as they express their lytic activity. They, the cell bursts open from that lytic activity and the phage particles leave. Okay, so we clearly have an active bacteriophage element inside an obligate intracellular bacteria. How is actually that happening? Uh, before I do that, let me tell you a little bit more about Wolbachia because it's got some cool biology. Okay, so uh, this is an embryo of uh, the insect Nasonia, which is a wasp that we study in our lab. And it's showing an early mitotically dividing embryo with the blue showing DNA of the host. And in green is the Wolbachia bacteria located at the posterior end of the embryo. These Wolbachia bacteria have been maternally transmitted from the mother's germarium and ovaries directly into the developing oocyte and now the egg that's developing. So this is exquisite maternal transmission of this intracellular symbiont. Um, in addition, this end of the embryo, posterior end, is what harbors the pole cells and essentially the somatic cells or the cells faded to become reproductive tissues. So Wolbachia are already in the part of the embryo that's destined to become the testes and ovaries which is where Wolbachia does its business to get inherited and also to modify the host through reproductive modifications. Pretty neat stuff. Now, we call it a pandemic because it's arguably one of the greatest pandemics in the history of life from a biodiversity perspective, not a human perspective. So Wolbachia infects at least 40% of all arthropod species. Arthropods comprise 85% of all animal species. So if you want to know what's the most successful parasite in the animal world, Wolbachia is certainly one of them, if not the most successful parasite in the animal world. Wolbachia has genetically diverged into several lineages. We just label these um, with letters instead of uh, species names because we're still trying to sort out the species status within the Wolbachia genus. And Wolbachia are also famously reproductive parasites that modify the sex ratio and sex determination systems of their host. Now, Wolbachia do this because they're maternally transmitted. And maternally transmitted elements are selected to increase the frequency of their transmitting sex, the host sex in the population. So if females transmit the bacteria, it's in Wolbachia's interest to make more females in the population, which then enhances Wolbachia's transmission. And there are fantastic ways in which Wolbachia do this. Um, I'll talk about one of them in the last half of the talk. Wolbachia are also in nematodes, filarial nematodes, and here we'll, they act as mutualists. They're actually required for oocyte production as well as larval development. And very interestingly, in the last decade or so, we've learned from some really good studies that the disease is normally associated with filarial nematodes, including river blindness and lymphatic filariasis, are in fact not caused by the nematode itself, but the Wolbachia symbionts that live inside the nematode. So the acute response that's causing these inflammation pathologies is to Wolbachia, not to the, to the insect. And there are programs now trying to develop anti-Wolbachia drugs to be able to effectively treat these, these conditions. A really good case where basic science has gone to biomedical science within the span of a decade. And, and, and so that's just been fun to observe. 
Okay, let's get back to the phage story. So the question that first interested us was, how do phages evolve in an obligate intracellular bacteria? How do they get into the system? There are three formidable barriers by which these phages could get in. The first is, there's obviously it has to get through a host animal to get into the bacterial population. The second is, is that in obligate intracellular bacteria, there's a membrane that obviously prevents, there's a host membrane that surrounds the obligate intracellular bacteria. This is also a barrier. And then there are multiple barriers because the bacteria has its own two membranes to essentially prevent these phages from getting in. So with these challenges, with a model that let's not think about the barriers, but let's think about the opportunities by which phages can flourish in an intracellular bacteria. And the hypothesis is that animals are incubators of genetic transfer between intracellular co-infections. Essentially, they're chemostats. The animal cell, or the host itself, is a chemostat for gene transfer, even in the most restrictive class of bacteria, these obligate intracellular bacteria. So let's look, imagine that we take any kind of animal and we look inside its cells. There may be uh, co-infections of different intracellular bacteria that now exchange bacteriophage elements. And the source of these bacteriophage elements may actually come from facultative intracellular bacteria, because as we said in the beginning, these bacteria come and go. They infect inside cells, and they can get outside, so outside cells. So perhaps facultative intracellular bacteria seed these mobile elements into the obligate intracellular world, and then these can now spread by transfer. So what is traditionally thought of as a closed niche, the intracellular bacterial world, could be opened through these various routes. So are, is there any evidence that supports that model? So we started out doing single gene phylogenetics uh, several years ago, and we wanted to essentially ask, does the phage tree uh, run parallel to the host Wolbachia tree to see if there's any evidence of horizontal transmission or not? So here's the two major groups of Wolbachia that infect arthropods. They're estimated to have diverged about 60 million years ago, and these other lineages are primarily in filarial nematodes. And I've color-coded these two groups because when we did the phylogeny of this phage capsid gene, and we can see there's a lot of diversity in different haplotypes within this phage, but when we color-code it, we can see that there's no clustering of the A phage and the B phage separately. And this is a random mixture of these phage haplotypes. So this is usually taken as strong evidence for horizontal transfer of an element within or between these two hosts. So to actually dig further into that and test this hypothesis, um, where we take a host, and what we're imagining here is that that single host has multiple bacterial symbionts in it, two types of Wolbachia in this case. One of them has the phage, in this case the blue cells, and this phage is produced and in fact infects a uh, recipient in naive Wolbachia cell. If that's the model that's happening, if we can somehow separate out the A and B Wolbachia into different lines, where we have animals that are singly infected with one strain or the other, and then ask, is the phage gene shared? We can just PCR clone and sequence those genes and do a phylogenetic analysis. All right. So if there's different Wolbachia, but they have the same genes, and remember these Wolbachia are 60 million years old, then that would be also additional evidence for phage transfer. Okay, so this has been done now in five systems, four of which we've worked on in various field populations as well as lab lines, and a fifth one published by a Japanese group in 2000. Um, this work was done in collaboration with uh, Megan Chaffee, who a, was a uh, technician in my lab, as well as Dan Funk and Richard Harrison. Uh, Dan's at the uh, Vanderbilt with me, and Rick Harrison's at Cornell. And they provided some of the insect samples that we could, in fact, do this work in. And the condition for these insect samples is there had to be multiple infections in them. We had to have lines that we could separate out that were just single infected A, single infected B. Or there had to be multiple B infections that were genetically different, and these were then segregated out. In each case, when we looked at the co-infections, we were able to see that the phage genes were identical between these different Wolbachian co-infections in the same host. So there's no way to look at this except to say that there's rapid uh, exchange of these phage elements and recent exchange of these phage elements between co-infections 
of the same host. So now that we've observed that there's been this gene transfer of this phage element between co-infections, um, is this gene moving, are these phage genes moving by single genes through recombination, or are they potentially moving through whole genome transfers of the bacteriophage genome from one cell to another? So we did this work with um, uh, Bethany Ken, who was a former postdoc in the lab, as well as Antonis Rokas, a colleague at Vanderbilt, and some of his graduate students, uh, John Gibbons and Leo Salitas. And essentially what we're asking here is if we can sequence the entire genome of these A and B Olbachia strains, and then ask do they share a prophage region, we can show that, and we could potentially test whether there's been a whole genome transfer of the phage between these two different Olbachia. The way we did that is we um, wanted to develop a new method to isolate out symbionts from a host, or essentially isolate out one microbe among a conglomerate of microbes and eukaryotic genes that are in this host. And so we used targeted genome capture to capture the Wolbachia genome away from the host material and away from the other symbionts that are inside the host. And we simply um, do that by Using a microarray, in this case, we used it with NimbleGen. It was the early days for sequence capture, and NimbleGen was uh, one of the leaders at the time. And we've made an array with Wolbachia genome information on it. There are 80 base pair probes printed on this, printed on this array. So if you were just to take uh, an animal and macerate it up that we know is infected with Wolbachia, the DNA from this animal would be captured onto the array. Um, and essentially, only the Wolbachia DNA, the target DNA, would be captured and everything else would wash off the array. Um, we then moved to eluding that off the array and sequencing it. So this had never been done before for symbionts. Um, it could clearly scale to, uh, to clinical settings where one would want to take out a pathogen from somebody who's sick and they wouldn't want to sequence all the other stuff. So we just wanted to prove this technology would be good. And we got lucky. We didn't know how well it would work, but it turns out that 98% of the nucleotides that we sequenced came from our target, intended target, Wolbachia. Um, there was some host contamination, so one, about 1%. One However, that contamination is primarily from Wolbachia genes that have inserted into the Nasonia genome. So we essentially captured Wolbachia, but it's just moved to the insect host genome. So that, that's a pretty good target. Um, it also can help us understand how common bacterial gene inserts are in animal genomes. Secondly, or, uh, secondly, we've now also captured some other 16S ribosomal RNA genes that are highly conserved. And then there's this category where there was just no match to the database. So we captured apparently new information. And this AT coding bias in this, in this portion of the sort of uncategorized reads actually matched the AT bias of the lot. So the AT bias is something like 65% in Wolbachia. It's actually pretty diagnostic of, or generally diagnostic of symbionts. And because this category was showing a similar nucleotide bias, we actually think of this is new information that we captured off the array that goes into the full assembly of the Wolbachia genome. All right. So getting to the phage, um, and once we were able to put all this together, again, we're looking at two Wolbachia infections in the same host. We've sequenced their genomes and now look at the entire prophage regions of these genomes. <laughs> So prophage Wo in the A. Wolbachia is 52 kilobases long. Um, its genes are intact in coding, and it is a temperate phage. Clearly, it inserts into the genome and excises. So when we look at the B. Wolbachia genome, it's completely syntenic with the A. Wolbachia genome, with the exception of these yellow blocks. And these yellow blocks are transposon insertions that have actually inserted into the genome and knocked out the adjacent genes around them. Interestingly, this is a genome that's inactive. It does not form any active phage particles. And this is consistent with clearly the knockouts occurring in the tail and the head region, which are essential for infectious particles. Um, so what we have is a recent transfer, a full genome transfer, and uh, um, yes, I believe it's that. OK, so how, how recent was the transfer? Well, if you look at the homology here and you, ask, and you ask how much nucleotide similarity there is between these genomes, on average, there's 99.9% .9 genome similarity. So this transfer happened recently. 
which also means the transposon insertions that occurred also happened recently as well. Um, when we look at other phage genes that are not intact, that are not part of a phage genome, but are just isolated as remnants, this was a nice internal control to show that they are, in fact, way more divergent, significantly divergent, than the total phage genome that we know is not transferred. And if you look at MLST typing genes for Wolbachia, these are also more divergent between the A and B Wolbachia than the phage genes. So the rest of the A and B genome is divergent. The only thing that's closely related to is this bacteriophage that's undergone a complete transfer. Uh, another way to look at that is from a phylogenetic perspective. So here's just the Wolbachia MLST uh, uh, genes collated into it. A. Wolbachia and B. Wolbachia that diverged about 60 million years ago. And here is the phage tree showing the two A and B haplotype. phages, but they're uh, completely identical, showing recent transfer. So the conclusion from this work is when you look in an intracellular community, in this Wolbachia community, this phage is transferring all the time and bringing lots of new information into this genome of an obligate intracellular bacteria. Okay, so that's the permissive part. Now I'm going to offer a contrarian view, which is that there are constraints in this intracellular world, expectations, or endosome bonds, which is that the WO, the phage genome, exhibits repeated instances of genome reduction, where deletions are happening in the phage genome just like they happen in the endosymbiotic genome. And that's where the constraint in the intracellular world comes into. So this is work done by Bethany again and Lisa Funkhauser, a graduate student in my lab now. Uh, we looked at 16 WO genomes. They're color-coded for gene function. And you can see that about half the genomes, the top half, are almost intact and, and full genomes, from a recombinase section to a head section to a base plate to a tail. However, the other half here is subject to deletion, subject to significant deletions in the tail regions and often in the replication modules as well. So these are inactive phages, as far as we can tell, and I'll show you some evidence for that. The top half are active phages that are temperate, producing the particles in these obligate intracellular bacteria. If you sum up the gene and the, um, I'm sorry, the gene frequency. Of these, of these genes across these 16, 16 WO genomes. What we see, and I'd actually like some soft thoughts on this if anybody has any, is if you look at this black line, which includes all the 16 genomes, only the head and base plate genes are universally conserved, even in the phage genomes that have significant deletions. So this implies to me, at least, that there might be some function of the head and base plate genes, even in the reduced phage WO genomes that don't produce active particles. What that function is, I would, I would love to hear some thoughts on. Um, what we can say is, essentially, you can think about the, the head and base plate phages having the head and base plate. And when the tail genes are present, of course, this phage has a full tail as well. Now, these are typically thought of as the infectious form, the active particle. So one question could be, perhaps these are still active and we just are assuming that they're inactive based on the deletion of the tail region. So we went ahead and did some viral metagenome on these insects, and we're able to purify out the viruses and sequence them on a high seq and show that only the reads that map to these reference genomes are the ones that come from the tail phages, whereas there were very few reads, if not just homologous reads, between the two genomes that, that hit the genes of the non-tail phages. So what this means is particle producing genomes that have DNA inside them always come from the tail phages, confirming that that's the active fraction of the phage community. I still don't know why the head and base plate genes would be conserved in a non-tailed phage. Um, in terms of new gene acquisition, because bacteriophages are sort of rule number one, are vectors of new genes in the bacterial world, especially free living bacteria. Um, so we looked at the number or the percentage of new genes transferred into these phages. About 0 to 10% of the genome is, is co-opted for essentially harboring new uh, phage genes. And most of those new phage genes uh, occur in one preferential region, which is the region that's uncharacterized. So it doesn't appear to have a core bacteriophage function. And 
perhaps one could rationalize this as this may be the permissive area in which new gene inserts can occur in a phage genome. But in the essential structural genes of a phage, if you get an insert in that region, it may knock out that function and knock out the phage. So given that these phages are moving around a lot, and given that these phages are also undergoing deletional events, uh, we reason that these phages could be hotspots of genomic diversity in the Wallachia genome. So we did a microarray analysis and compared five Wolbachia strains that are closely related to a reference Wolbachia strain from Drosophila melanogaster, and found that among the genes that were divergent or absent, um, most of them clustered in these regions labeled pink here that are prophage regions or adjacent to prophage regions. So depending upon the strain we look at, about 21 to 87 percent of the genome um, is divergent or absent where the phages are. Um, so this looks a lot like how free-living bacterial genomes change as well. But this is an obligate intracellular bacteria with hot spots of diversity around the bacteriophage. So not only do we see lots of transfer between Wolbachia, we've seen transfer between Wolbachia and other intracellular bacteria. So this is a case where there's a rickettsial plasmid that shares about 10 genes in common with this particular phage region. And at the nucleotide level, there's about 70% homology of these genes. The function of these genes is peculiar. I just don't know what's going on, why these genes are actually in phages or plasmids or why they're transferred between them. But the interesting part is that Wolbachia and Rickettsia both infect the ovaries of a tick. So the ecological arena here now is, is common to both these bacteria, which would facilitate exchange in the intracellular world. And I'll talk that off with one example of the facultative intracellular bacteria that's also exchanged information with Wolbachia. So Bartonella hanseli is the causative agent of cat scratch disease. Um, it normally occurs in cat fleas, for example. And it has several prophage regions marked in purple. Um, this particular prophage region shares homology with some of the Wolbachia prophages as well. So what's the explanation there? Well, it turns out that they both infect cat fleas um, not infrequently. So that provides an opportunity for this ecological arena to extend out to facultative to obligate intracellular exchange. Okay. There are two views of phage evolution that we can put on the bacterial world. The bacterial, uh, the free living bacterial world, excuse me, on the left here, is usually viewed through massive amounts of genetic exchange and exchange of genes that are very different between different phages. So here's a free living bacteria A and free living bacteria B. They have very different phages. What's very common in these phages is a modular exchange of genes between these different phages. And they can be chimeric genomes because of that. In the obligate intracellular world, we see lots of transfer, but it's constrained within the intracellular host or the intracellular arena of that host. Uh, we do see potential inversions, we do see transposon insertions, as well as knockouts, but we aren't seeing this kind of promiscuous genetic exchange that is normally seen in the free-living world. All right. Uh, we have uh, uh, obligate intracellular bacteria that can now exchange information with obli other obligate intracellular bacteria, as well as facultative intracellular bacteria. Uh, in addition, we have uh, seen a probably the largest gene transfer to date in the obligate intracellular bacterial world. This 50 kb phage transfer that's happened between A and B Wolbachia inside the same host. And this targeted genome capture method to capture symbionts was really effective for Wolbachia. It's being used to capture um, others as well. Uh, maybe good for transcriptomics to capture RNA sequences from microbial from microbial symbionts. I think it scales even to the clinic if people need that. Burton, is all this work in the end? Well, I'd like to put it in perspective. And we now have a few instances of, that sort of provide a trajectory to explain this. So, Wolbachia is a very common intracellular symbiont, and it has phages. Chlamydia is also an intracellular bacteria. It's very widespread. It lives in different hosts. And in fact, you can see these little bubbles uh, uh, coming off of the uh, chlamydia cells. And inside those bubbles are bacteriophage particles. So there is a, a bacteriophage in chlamydia as well. Mitochondria and chloroplasts are up on this slide because there are genes involved in transcription and replication 
ancient phage genes that have invaded these genomes and maintain themselves in these genomes as the functional components for those processes. So what's the common theme here? The common theme is if you're extremely abundant, whether you're an ancient bacteria that becomes an organelle or current day widespread ancient, widespread obligate intracellular bacteria, you, suscept, you make yourself susceptible to parasites because of your frequency and how common you are. Sort of like a kill the winner idea that if you get too successful, you're gonna get parasites sneaking up behind you. And that's how I view these mobile element acquisitions in, in these various types of intracellular bacteria. Okay. Any questions on that before I move on to the second part? So part two is the flip side on the agents of change. And the question I want to uh, now raise is sort of fundamentally different from the first, which is do symbionts enhance the origin of new species? And the simplest way to think about this is, first of all, the normal way evolutionary biologists approach speciation and then the symbiotic. So the genetic way is that you take an ancestral population that splits into two. And that... Uh, that split in those two populations allow those populations to accrue different mutations, ultimately potentially a speciation event. So this is a diversification event. Now, symbiosis is a merger event in which we bring together two different species and ultimately make a third new species, which seems somewhat contrary to the diversification, right? Because this is more like an osmotic way of combining species to make a new species, and this is a diversification event. So already this is a sort of a non-traditional way of thinking about evolution of new species. It's actually interesting to go back into history because I like to always put my work in the context of the, the smart biologists um, early on who probably thought of all this stuff but didn't have the capacity to actually analyze it. So you, you notice Dobzhansky on the left, right? Um, 1937 publishes one of the great books on evolution and biology and speciation for that matter, genetics and the origin of species. Well, 10 years earlier, a guy you probably don't know that well, Ivan Wallen, uh, published a book called Symbionticism in the Origin of Species. And I would wager that, in fact, Dzansky probably just stole this title and replaced Symbionticism with Genetics. And his book becomes famous, and Wallen uh, pretty much died an early death in the history of evolution and biology. So, what's the deal here? Well, Ivan Wallen was known as the mitochondria man. He came up with the first hypothesis that mitochondria are, in fact, bacteria or anciently derived bacteria. Um, typically, we credit this to Lynn Margulis, but he was on the track of at least hypothesizing about it. Um, Lynn mounted sort of a second wave of, of, of showing that. Um, so Wallen observed simply the binary fission of mitochondria as evidence that they were bacteria. And before mitochondria being called out as bacteria, chloroplasts were actually called out as bacteria. So we had some pre-existing systems to sort of understand how mitochondria and chloroplasts have some analogous processes. Okay, so he rationalized that because mitochondria are the essential, the essential feature of cells, they must be incredibly important to speciation. They can bring together bacteria and different hosts into something new. He was ridiculed ultimately because he claimed to have cultured mitochondria on plates, and that was obviously due to contamination. And his, 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 his career is sort of measured by that last statement. But he, gets, he actually deserves a lot of credit for coming up with some of these early ideas on mitochondria. And ultimately, so in, the dec, in the decades that follow, we have an incredible amount of work on the genetics of speciation. And in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, we tend to see uh, a lot of things about why symbionts would not be important to speciation. Perhaps they're not specific to hosts. Perhaps they're not abundant in hosts. Um, perhaps there's very little diversity of the symbiont population. And finally, they're just not important to host fitness. Well, in the last decade or two, we've had uh, a shift in how, how these things have all been sort of turned upside down. We know that symbionts are abundant. We know they're incredibly diverse. We know they're essential to adaptations. So there's been a whole lot of work on showing why symbionts are so essential to the fitness of an organism. Little less work has been done on its implications of speciation. So this is my graduate student, Robert Brucker, who I mentioned earlier at the opening. Um, his thesis is essentially hypothesized that 
the species microbiota can drive reproductive isolation. And it can drive it in a narrow sense and a broad sense. The narrow sense is microbial induced isolation is essentially a microbe microbe interaction that causes a direct trait of reproductive isolation. A good case would be Wolbachia, that I'll tell you about in just a second. The broader sense is that microbes assist genetic evolution of the host and cause reproductive isolation. So here's a case where microbes might drive the rapid evolution of immune genes, and let's say those immune genes become hybrid incompatibility factors. Now we're seeing a gene microbe evolution or a broader component to reproductive isolation, whereas the narrow sense is all microbe microbe based. I'll tell you what we mean the Nasonia system. So this is a video of our, our friendly neighbors. Um, they're about two millimeters in size. Um, this is a female being courted by a male, which is also going to be shown up here. So the female is essentially walking away, and the male will attempt to chase her down and mount her on top. Oh, the suspense is killing me. Okay, and so he'll then proceed with a courtship display where he spits stuff out at her, he swings his antenna, he nods his head, and he's trying to excite her. And if she does get excited, um, she'll open up for receptivity and, and, be, and be mated. So Nisonia is a beautiful system for doing speciation work. It's an extremely young animal system that has varying amounts of reproductive isolation. I want to point you to these three species as you watch the video. So Geraldi and Longicornis, which we'll refer to as NL and NG, diverged about 400,000 years ago. We could call this the younger species. And then this older species pairs, which is essentially Vitropenis relative to Geraldi and Longicornis, that diverged about a million years ago. Right. We have all sorts of great tools. These are interbreedable species. Um, they're easily maintained. They're the Drosophila of the wasp world. Okay. So here's the narrow sense um, sort of broad picture, which is that Wolbachia are one of the most abundant microbes in insect species. Actually, I've got the old number up. It's actually 40%, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the insects are the most abundant animal species, and this is just a biodiversity chart of all species documented on the planet. It's probably outdated since it's from 2000, but it shows we know or categorize insect species much better than any other system. So is there some correlation or causation between these two things? That Wolbachia is extremely abundant, and it's also known to multiply in, in insects. And cytoplasmic incompatibility is the most common form of Wolbachia's modifications, and it's a one-way crossing incompatibility in which infected males, colored in with this Wolbachia cell here, uh, are incompatible with uninfected females. They don't produce any offspring. But the reciprocal cross, the uninfected male to the infected female, is compatible. And because Wolbachia is maternally transmitted, the offspring get the infection. Uh, the self-crosses are also compatible. And what I'm showing here are Wolbachia infecting the reproductive tissues. So this is the testes of the Nasonia wasp, and this is the egg. Uh, the egg and, and testes are stained with a propidium iodide stain for DNA and then Wolbachia same they green. So Wolbachia are in the testes and potentially modify the sperm to a degree that essentially renders them incompatible with an uninfected egg. Why do Wolbachia do this? Well, Wolbachia is essentially creating suicide males that reduce the fitness of uninfected females. By reducing the fitness of uninfected females, there's a relative increase in the fitness of infected females which thereby enhances the spread of the infection because infected females are the transmitting sex of Wolbachia. Right? How Wolbachia has evolved to do this is one of the, the major challenges in the field, how, how the simple bacteria hijacks reproduction and carry it to do this, certainly on the agenda of some labs. We know cytologically that the failure, the incompatibility, happens in the first mitotic division after fertilization. So here are the genomes undergoing the first mitosis, and the problem starts to become apparent in pro-metaphase 
and ultimately metaphase where the paternal genome on the left here is uncondensed relative to the maternal genome. Condensation of the chromatin has to happen to go through mitosis, but the paternal genome fails to condense. That failure then leads to uh, what's called telomeric bridging during the telophase stage. The cells are dividing. The maternal chromatin is dividing, but the paternal chromatin has been lost in the process, essentially being shredded apart. And this is what leads to death in the embryos and the incompatibility. All right. So the model now that we can apply is in a narrow sense, you can imagine that Wolbachia drives reproductive isolation. If you start with an ancestral population, it splits into two. You have different Wolbachia infections acquired in those two populations, genetically different. And then they then actually spread by unidirectional CI to fixation. And when these two populations come back into contact, there's a reciprocal isolation barrier. Because you only get a normal cross when a male and a female have the same strain of Wolbachia. But in this case, the males and females have different infection statuses, and this leads to crossing incompatibility in both directions. Speciation is effectively underway here based on the biological species concept. And it's solely based on the infection, not any changes in the host genome. So, things I did in, in my PhD is show that this is occurring in the Nasonia complex. So these are the two species pairs. The controls are on the outsides and the interspecific cross are on the, is in the middle. And the nomenclature just stands for vitropenis duralti and longicornis. Now here's the crosses when they're both infected and you can see that there's strong F1 incompatibility that produces less hybrids. Now when you cure them of their Wolbachia infection with antibiotics, you restore compatibility significantly, if not completely, showing that this incompatibility caused by Wolbachia is the strongest isolation barrier in the Nasonia hybridization. All right. If you look at problems, other reproductive isolation traits between these two Nasonia species pair, the older species pair has an accumulation of F1 and F2 problems, as well as more description. All the younger species pair shows is a strong degree of cytoplasmic incompatibility and a little bit of mate discrimination, showing that Wolbachia induced isolation can evolve prior to the evolution of other genetically based reproductive isolation traits, therefore it's fueling the process of speciation. So if you imagine that there's some correlation between genetic divergence and reproductive isolation, and at some point you become a species, what Wolbachia can do is come into a young speciation event and push it completely to speciation because it's just an immediate isolation barrier. <laughs> All right, how often? There are several other systems where we there's good evidence that there's reproductive isolation caused by Wolbachia. This is not an isolated case. Um, and that, I think, is pretty exciting to, to think about how common this process might be. So if we look at Wallen's original hypothesis, he was imagining probably a much more common phenomenon of that. It's not just one bacteria that perhaps fuels speciation. It could be the total community, the total microbial community that may assist speciation. His quote that I think lives on is, it's a rather startling proposal that bacteria, the organisms which are popularly associated with disease, may represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. I probably wouldn't go that far myself, but I don't think it's also um, unrealistic to think that the microbial community may be important in a speciation of them. Tearing apart the Nasonia system beyond the Wolbachia story and looking at the gut microbiota. And uh, if you take a cross section and you stain it for gamma proteobacteria, um, all of the stain essentially localizes to the hind, which, which is where that is right there. All right. Um, one of the things we've seen in Masonia, which parallels the human world, is that as an animal develops, it becomes more phylogenetically diverse with microbes. So this paper came out in Nature recently that showed among several populations of humans, on the left here, there's an increase in microbial diversity over time. A lot of that increase in the diversity happens in the first couple of years. In Masonia, we see a simple community in the larval stages in a more complex community that blossoms over time through pupation and adulthood into a more rich community represented by these colors in the pie charts. All right? So I suspect that's going to be a fairly common phenomenon in animals. 
Um, we've also looked at this through rear fraction curve analyses. Um, so these are each of the three species and each of the three developmental stages, which shows that the developmental stage progression in diversity is always from larval to pupa to adult. And you can see that the species have some differences in how abundant their microbial diversity is. All right. Um, <clears throat> Before we get into the speciation stuff, I want to first uh, confront the issue of diet has a se uh, received an incredible amount of attention, and rightfully so, for its influence on the microbial uh, gut, the gut microbiome, right? So if, you're, if you eat a standard Western diet like this guy, or if you eat a vegan diet, you're going to have very different microbial communities in your gut. So diet is a variable one needs to control for uh, if you want to understand, is there a species-specific microbiota in a host? Is there, a, is there a way that a host selects for and maintains a specific microbial community? So we maintain our wasps on the same fly host. So essentially the diet's already controlled for in our lab. And we can now ask, is there a essentially a historical or phylogenetic component to how the host microbiome is structured? Okay. So here's our model. Essentially, if you control for diet, other variables you can think of. You will have microbial community divergence parallel the evolution of post genetic divergence. At least that's a hypothesis. We don't know if it's necessarily true. And at each point along this curve, we can imagine that step one, we don't have any discrete species yet. Step two is on the way to speciation. Step three, maybe completely different species, good species. And the change in genetic divergence parallels the change in the microbial community divergence. So in an artistic way, we can imagine that as species evolve, their bacterial community is changing in constituents or abundance relative to species evolution. All right, so we were able to test this in the Sonia, and we were able to test it at several different developmental stages. So on the left is the Nasonia species complex relationships, and on the right is the microbial community relationships based on a unifrac analysis. Um, the larval microbial diversity is relatively simple and does not show parallel changes to the host phylogeny. However, the pupil stages and the adult stages do. You'll see that by the fact that Geralta and Longicornis share similar constituents of their microbial community, more <laughs> similar than to Vigipennis, at the pupil stage. And then there's a different microbial community that blossoms and is richer, but we still maintain that relationship in the adult stage. So when diversity is increased during the pupation, and adult stages, we see parallel changes to what the host uh, phylogeny is as well. Okay. So just to put this graphically, um, we can essentially imagine that as Nasonia changes over time, and this is actually the fly host as well, but as a speciation event happens, the microbial community changes in parallel. We don't know how common this is, um, if it scales to other organisms, perhaps vertebrates, but if it does, it suggests that there's a species-specific microbiota, some fraction of which is changing, perhaps in conjunction with changes with the host genome. My guess would be that that's mediated through the immune system and the immune genes that are rapidly evolving to maintain this microbial specificity. So how important is, is this process? Um, and this is kind of a neat figure which shows animal evolution, but on a, on a, on a bacterial culture plate. Um, and is this common? Is this common? We don't know, but we're going to certainly bury our heads in a little while and see if we're wrong. Um, so in terms of importance, we have the Wolbachia story um, explaining a number of cases of speciation in invertebrates. Um, there's also the broad sense stuff that I haven't given you a lot of background on yet, but there's cases where mating discrimination in, in Drosophila melanogaster, one stock of Drosophila melanogaster, if the bacteria vary in these Drosophila melanogaster because they're feeding on different diets, they won't mate with each other or they'll have reduced mating. That same genetic organism is now reproductively isolated because of the bacteria, which it's been shown that those bacteria change the cuticular hydrocarbon compounds to affect mate discrimination. We know numerous cases in which symbionts control nutrition to their hosts, including ourselves. So there's clearly adaptations or ecological adaptations that may be assisting radiations of hosts to different resources in which the symbionts assist those radiations. 
Um, there are cases in Arabidopsis where you could take populations, hybridize them, and get these dwarf hybrids, these really small hybrids. Those genetic factors that control that dwarfism are, in fact, immune genes. So immune genes that negatively interact with each other and create this small hybrid. The immune genes are essentially the interactor with the microbiome. And finally, just hybrids in general. <laughs> yes. All right. So the joke worked. Uh, may be susceptible to pathogens because a hybrid background is a conglomerate of two immune gene systems that come together, and we don't get normal function to regulate and maintain the microbiome. And the teaser for uh, Rob's talk is that we have hybrids in the Sonia that die, and they become melanized, uh, as if there's an inflammation response happening in this larval stage. And we're now hot on the trail of showing that the microbes are, in fact, causing the mortality of these hybrids, not the host genetics, or at least that they're assisting it in some way. OK, so I'm going to actually not be able to talk about that today. But I do want to uh, thank you all for listening um, and thank my funding agencies, the NIH, GMS, and the NSF uh, Dimensions of Biodiversity Program. Uh, and all these people who I already mentioned in the talk uh, have helped contribute to this work. And I can wrap it up there. So thanks, everybody.